Greetings and welcome to another lecture on comparative psychology. Now, in the first part of the lecture, I talked about how, in terms of optimal foraging, the uh, important things to look at are energy expenditure as well as the handling time of the food. But what also needs to be taken into account, you need to realize, is that it's not just those two things, because encounter rate plays a role also. How often the individual runs into that food makes basically a difference. It's another factor that goes into that. Essentially, and it makes sense if you think about it, the encounter rate of the most profitable food determines whether the less profitable food, profitable food is taken. Now, profitable, remember, is basically the combination of the energy and the handling time. Higher energy, lower handling time. That's profit. So, of course, if you're running into the most profitable food all the time, then you're just going to ignore the less profitable food, right? You're just going to ignore it entirely because it doesn't make any sense to go for that less profitable food when you have the most profitable food all around. However, what if the most profitable food is scarce? What if the most profitable food is just not really available? I have friends who uh, make money online by answering surveys, basically. And so foraging runs, runs into this as well, because they need to determine whether when there is a survey, they can only do one survey at a time. And so they need to determine whether or not they want to do that survey or wait for a more profitable survey. And what that depends on in this case, by the way, profit is literally profit. It's how much they get paid, which isn't very much, but still. Uh, if they know that there are going to be more profitable surveys coming along, they're much more likely to pass on the less profitable one in order to be ready for the more profitable one. And the same thing is true with non-human animals. If a non-human animal knows, you know, if, if I'll, I'll go back to a dolphin, if a dolphin knows that lovely, great, big, tasty mullets are going to be coming around at some point, mullets are nice and big, then they may not spend their time going after smelt, which are a whole lot smaller, have a whole lot less food value, and might even be harder to catch because they're smaller and they move really fast. Um, so a dolphin might just wait around for that mullet to come around. On the other hand, if mullets are scarce and they're basically smelt everywhere, they're literally swimming in smelt, it would make more sense then to just go for the common food. It makes a lot more sense to just go for that food that you are just drowning in. That's very easy to find. It might not be as profitable. It might not have as many calories. It might take a little bit more handling time, but still it's there and it's there now. We see this not only in animals like dolphins. There's a lot of examples of this. And it's one of the things that kind of startled a lot of researchers. For instance, if we look back 50 years or so ago and you asked uh, researchers, okay, in the Arctic, let's say, what prey animals do wolves attack? What do wolves go for? And a lot of people would say, well, they go for deer and they go for elk and they go for caribou. They go for those big, astonishing, very, very caloric, dense creatures, right? Not always. Not always. Because those big, giant, caloric, dense creatures are hard to catch. They're hard to catch in terms that they run, that uh, it can be very difficult for a wolf or even a couple of wolves to catch one of those giant uh, deer or, or elk or caribou or moose or whatever. I mean, those things are dangerous. They will take you out and they take wolves out. So the wolf has to take into account not just the fact that it's a big meat bonanza, but also that it's something that may injure them. It's something that may tire them out. What if they just chase elk all day and never catch anything? That doesn't make any sense. So a lot of wolves, for instance, will eat mice. Now, mice are tiny. There's not a lot of calories there. So when we're talking about, you know, the amount of calories they can get, there's not a lot. But particularly in the summer in the Arctic, mice are everywhere. Mice are just, it's almost impossible to not find mice. They're everywhere. 
And so instead of going for, you know, a huge, uh, one, one huge prey, wolves have been known to spend a lot of time catching mice, catching a lot of little tiny prey, because there's very little handling time there. There's not a lot of calories, but there's not a lot of handling time. And they're everywhere. So the encounter rate is just sky high. Therefore, we're not going to go for that great big sort of, you know, prey item. We're going to spend a lot of time eating all these tiny little prey items. It's sort of the difference between if you go out for a meal that instead of getting, you know, one great big hamburger, instead you eat a whole lot of little things. You eat a whole lot of french fries, you eat a whole lot of popcorn, you eat a whole lot of something else. Because it's there and it's easier to do, you know, making a good hamburger or making a steak. You have to go get it, it's expensive, and you have to cook it right and everything. Well, heck, popcorn, you could be hip deep in decent popcorn very, very easily. It's not as nutritious, but if you eat a ton of it, it's still going to get you calories, if not total nutrition. The same thing occurs with bears. Again, we tend to think bears are out there, you know, taking down, you know, uh, deer and everything else. The only bears that are really permanent meat eaters are polar bears, and that's because they don't have a whole lot of choice. And even polar bears will sometimes choose to nosh on something a little smaller than to have to go for the great big ones. What do bears eat a lot of in the summer? They eat a lot of insects. They eat a lot of moths, they eat a lot of crickets, they eat a lot of various other insects that, in fact, when the insects are scarce, the bears actually go hungry because there might not be a lot of other food. But during these times of year, particularly as I said in the spring, there are bugs everywhere, they're hatching out, and, and then the bears might move on to, let's say, berries or other types of greenery. You know, black bears and grizzly bears don't spend all their time eating meat. They like it when they can get it. They will scavenge on wolf kills very often. For instance, Yellowstone, they've actually been known to chase wolves away from their kill. Uh, but they will also eat whatever is handy. Wolves are a lot, or excuse me, bears are a lot like people. Wolves are a little bit. We know that uh, coyotes, for instance, will also eat berries and so will uh, foxes and such. But, you know, bears pretty much eat whatever that they run into. The whole bears eat a lot of honey. Well, yeah, because when you think about it, honey is incredibly nutrient dense, isn't it? There's a lot of calories. There's a lot of other things in honey. And if a bear can find a bee tree, there's a ton, probably not a literal ton, but there's a lot of honey right there for the bear basically to eat. So, of course, they're going to do that. But if not, they'll also eat the bees, <laughs> by the way. Uh, but if, if they can't do that, then, you know, they'll go for whatever is handy because encounter rate's important as well. So, the other thing that needs to go on in optimal foraging is how long to stay in a patch. Now, a patch is essentially the term for a, a it's a patch of food, it's a food source. A patch could be a dead deer, a patch could be a berry bush, a patch could be a termite mound, a patch could be a patch could be a school of fish, a patch, could, I mean, you name it, it's just a clump of food. And when animals are foraging, they always have to take into account the profitability of where they're at. Are they in a place where there is a lot of food that's easy to get? Fantastic. They'll stay there. But how long? Do they stay there until they clean it out? Do they stay there until, you know, they think that there might be better options elsewhere? All of this is mathematical, by the way. If you really want to go into the math, you can. And look into how these things are predicted and actually how they tend to go along with what's happening here. Different areas, of course, are different densities of food. You might be, we'll, we'll use bears and berry patches because it's something that we can probably think about nicely. So the bear is in a berry patch and the berry patch has different densities. Some that might have a lot of berries, some might have a few berries, some might not be ripened yet, some might have already been eaten by other bears. And so the bear has to make a decision. Do I stay or do I go? Do I stay in this patch and eat everything in sight, or do I move on and find another patch and hopefully eat everything there? What does it take into account? It takes into account how much is left in this patch, the cost of moving, as well as the likelihood of finding food in that next patch. And so researchers have looked at this, of course, and a fellow named Charnov has come up with what he called the marginal value theorem. Okay. 
Again, this is mathematically based. Again, you don't need to know what the math is. But basically what this theorem says is this. A forager should stay in a patch until the value of that patch equals the average value of all patches in the area. The average value, remember, is going to include patches that have been cleaned out, patches that haven't been cleaned out, patches that, you know, aren't producing as much, patches that are. So the forager should stay in the patch until the individual has depleted that patch until the, for the average patch of all value. Why? Because moving to a new patch has costs. There is the energy cost to actually move to a new patch. There is the time cost, time that might be spent eating in that first patch instead of moving to a second. And because of this, there are a couple of other things to keep in mind when we're talking about patches, when we're talking about moving from one patch to another. One thing that needs to be taken into account is that the greater the time between the patches, the longer a forager should stay in a patch. These, once you accept that first line, these are all pretty obvious. You know, it's pretty obvious that if it's going to be a long way to the next berry patch, you should stay longer in the one that you're at and just really clean that sucker out. Okay? because it's going to take you a while in energy and time and possibly, well, maybe not a bear, but possibly being predated on when you're moving from patch to patch or getting injured or something else happening. And so therefore, if you know you're going to have to go a long time, you might want to clean out the patch or at least clean it out more than you might if the next patch is just, you know, right, right over yonder. So, we have the greater the time between patches, the longer a forager should stay in. And the patch quality in the area is poor. If there basically are not very good patches here, you should also then stay in the patch that you have. Because it's, you know, the bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Well, that's about catching things, but it's the same thing. If your patch quality is just fairly awful, and you don't know if the one you're going to move to is going to be better than the one that you're in. It might be worse than the one that you're in. You're definitely going to want to stay and clean out the one that you have instead of moving on to greener pastures that may not actually be greener. So these are things, like I said, these are things that animals actually weigh. We, we, we don't think they do it consciously the way a person might, but they weigh these things. There's been a lot of research in this. Like I said, my master's degree was in this. And they've looked a lot at birds choosing whether to move on and, you know, captivity. But they found that the mathematical models actually match up with what the individuals in the research actually does. And like I said, when you think about this, it logically makes sense. Think about it in terms of when you would decide to move from one patch to another. Maybe you could use this for your journal writing. You're in some, one particular patch of resources. When do you decide whether to move on to the next or whether to stay at the one you're at and forage there a bit longer? Something to think about.